and our amazing speaker for today is Dr. Christian Bowers. Dr. Bowers is the Associate Professor of Neurosurgery and Vice Chair of Clinical Affairs at University of New Mexico, Albuquerque, U.S. His areas of speciality include endoscopic and open skull base surgery, neurooncology, minimal invasive neurosurgery, and clinical research. He did his neurosurgical residency from University of Utah School of Medicine, followed by a fellowship in cerebrovascular and skull base. He has over 120 publications and has received multiple awards, including 2019 NREF Young Clinical Investigator Award and 2015 Synthesis Skull Base Award. Along with the excellent academics, he is also a great soccer player and was recognized as one of the best 11 players in the country of Division I Soccer by ESPN The Magazine. Thank you for joining us today. The floor is all yours, Dr. Bowers. Oh. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate the uh, invitation and you guys taking your time, taking time out of your uh, out of your weekend. I think I need to. Oh, there we go. It's got this. Uh, I'm going to come out for one second so I can click the got it button on the recording. Right, we should be good. So. It, um, all right. Perfect. Well, thanks for having me. Um, and real big honor for me to be able to come and share some of our ideas with you and what we've been kind of, I've spent the last, you know, five and a half years of my career um, focused on since I became an attending, which is really trying to figure out uh, how we can predict who's going to, you know, do well and who's not in neurosurgical oncology, um, specifically with regards to frailty, as many of these patients are older. And, you know, I always start out, I give this talk quite a bit of uh, different groups and I always show this picture and I ask the audience, you know, what is this, what is this a picture of? And, you know, everyone us usually will jump in and say, you know, old, old people. And so when we see these pictures, we think of, we think of older people, but, you know, that's kind of the misconception and really what frailty is built around is these are not just older people, but these are, these are people that are frail. I saw I was in London um, really for the first time this summer, and I saw this on the on the underground. And you know, in a lot of in a ways, these are vulnerable patients, and so frailty is a vulnerability. Um, it, not just it's not just about being older. And if you show people, you know, if you look at tumors that we see every day in nurse in neuro oncology, and you we look at these cases and we're like, oh, okay, I can take that out. That's pretty easy. That that case will come out. Or oh, look, it's superficial and it's small. You know, if I ask the medical students, say, hey, or residents, you know, here's these lesions, like, you know, is it a tricky surgery? Is it easy? And, you know, you get different opinions, but in general, oh, these will come out pretty easily, no problem. But as we start adding, you know, background to these, you know, these patients and your plans change, what if they're 60? What if they're 80? What if they're 90? What if they're 104? You know, at every level, what you, what your plan is that you had in your mind a few minutes ago changes. What if they're younger, 60, but they have pulmonary fibrosis and they have metastatic cancer and you find one of these lesions? What if they're 92 and they're super healthy? They run marathons, they climb Everest. Um, you know, we don't have a crystal ball, but the whole idea of this concept of what I've been trying to you know, work on ever, ever since I've become an attending is really trying to figure out how can we best predict what's gonna happen to patients so you can counsel patients and their families um, when you talk to them before surgery about what the risks are of that surgery. It's not, I think we all agree, it's not the same for a 60-year-old as it is for a 104-year-old, yeah, depending on what conditions they have. But, you know, we, these are all the things that we need, we need to learn and know. Um, this particular case was a gentleman that was um, about 70 years old and, you know, not a difficult case particularly. And he, he had a metastasis from a renal cell and he did, he did great. But this was a patient who, was 81 and super health, super robust, uh, non-frail. She was active. She, you know, did really well. She didn't want to have surgery initially. It was a little bit smaller. We re-imaged her because told her we thought it was malignancy, but she was kind of terrified of surgery. But we thought, you know, and gave her, I think at the best time, the best counsel we had, which was that she would most likely do well. It was a short surgery. She actually went home the next day as if she'd been a young, you know, young, the, the robust non-frail patient that she was. And she came back three days later with seizures from the other temporal lobe, you know, side. There wasn't a discrete lesion, but she basically was in status. And then she had to get intubated to have the seizures controlled. And the family said she wouldn't, you know, she wouldn't want to have to go to a rehabilitation or anything like that. And they withdrew on her. So, you know, it's not a perfect science by any means. Um, you know, surgery never is guaranteed, but we're trying to, you know, figure that out. This was an older patient that had a bunch of medical problems, but 
you know, we minimized the risk and they did well. This is my family. Um, we were in London this summer. Um, and uh, uh, my oldest is 11 and my youngest is five and a half. So this is a uh, reason why we do everything. And this is the part of the country that of the United States that I grew up in and have lived most of my life. I was born in California. We've moved, to, I lived there six years, moved to Seattle, Washington, six years. And then we moved to Utah. My family's been there for 30 now. Um, I was only there six years, went to school in Colorado, uh, and then uh, did medical school in Washington, D.C., but then did residency in Utah, did three years in attending in New York, and have now kind of settled in New Mexico. So the Southwest has kind of been, it's kind of been my home. And when I was in Utah, it is a population of the uh, part of the world where there's uh, many members of a faith that don't uh, drink or smoke, and you have a lot of healthy people that are older. So that's where I kind of started getting in, getting really interested in Salt Lake City, um, which was my hometown, which is also where I did, you know, and had grown up and my family had been there forever. And I did residency. And so I knew a lot of, of people, my neighbors and family members who were, had never, you know, drunk alcohol or smoked tobacco and were always exercising and were in their 60s, 70s, 80s. And when I looked at the literature, um, you know, and what it said about older people, I just, it didn't match what I was seeing in my day-to-day -day practice as a resident. I could see that we had older patients that did well all the time with surgery and one of the first things we looked at was a trauma study. And it was in this transitional kind of period where some of the literature in the late 90s, you know, had talked about not being aggressive with people in their 60s and 70s um, with that traumatic injuries, et cetera. They wouldn't transfer them and so forth. But, you know, um, and they they had had a, some editorials in different journals had recommended to, you know, err on not doing transfer, not, not, not being aggressive. But this is in the neurosurgical literature and in trauma, this is when, you know, people started realizing it's not really all about age, but, you know, that's not the only thing that determines outcome. So when I was a resident, before I knew about frailty, we would check a Charleston comorbidity index on different studies we did. I've always been interested in outcomes research. And um, we looked at vestibular schwannomas and with surgical treatment, you know, does age matter? Because there's, in the literature, some studies would say, well, if they're over 60 or 65, you can never operate on them. You always have to radiate them and, you know, the opposite if they're younger. But um, we studied this at our institution um, and we found that there was no difference in outcomes um, with facial nerve, hearing preservation, complications between older and younger uh, vestibular schwannoma patients. And that was not really what had been published in the literature, but it wasn't that, you know, the literature was wrong. It's that we were talking about apples and oranges. Everyone's just talking about the older patients versus the younger patients, but, you know, an older non-frail robust patient, you know, is different than older frail patient. And so you had people in areas with a lot of frail patients. Well, in those situations, the older patients probably shouldn't have surgery, but in our, where we were at and everyone was healthy and we had, you know, a center with high volume, the older patients that were healthy and robust, um, you know, could undergo surgery and do very well. And, you know, when I give this talk, I always use just as one example, this Japanese uh, triathlete, Hiromu Nada, who still runs, um, tri you know, triathlons, um, Ironman competitions at age 89. And so, you know, he's robust. He He's going to be categorized and looked at differently as, as someone who's even, you know, much younger, 60, but has a bunch of medical problems. So he's our example of robust, but we have frail people and they can be younger, um, you know, older, obviously. The more you age, the more frail you're going to be. And this is just telling us what I'm sure is somewhat similar is similar in Pakistan to here, which is as as time is going on, we're getting more and more older older people. And we're seeing them in our clinics and we're seeing them in the emergency room. We're seeing them, um, you know, in consultation by other services asking, you know, for neurosurgery to intervene. And so this is just the United States. But if on the left is 2010 and the green is 2019, male left, female right, but you can just tell between two that in 2010, the younger, like the older populations, um, is it's just increasing every decade, more and more and more older patients, less and less and less younger patients. Um, and in the United States, um, you have this large increase from 2010 to 2020 for the pop center of the population who is over um, 65 and older. So in like where we're at down in the Southwest, it's not uncommon to have the vast majority of the patients I've had that shift, um, you know, um, to have that big change in the population group. And as everyone knows, um, when you get older, it's you're more likely to have um, health challenges and problems. Um, so, 
this is just different proportions of patients with these deficits or issues, mobility, disability, thyroid, arthritis, vision problems. But remember this because we'll come back to it. Um, this different models of frailty, they're not, there's not one agreement. There's a physical and biological model looking at these different components and areas, weight loss, exhaustion, weakness, slowness, low physical activity. I, I'm a particular fan of the deficit accumulation model. It's where I do most of my research right now. And this is um, looking at a number of factors, looking at different diseases, how the comorbidities interplay, but also how, um, you know, sometimes how lab values come in and how people's activity is. And we, you know, you divide those, give yourself a frailty index, a number that we can use to compare um, across different disease states. Um, there's a multidimensional kind of biopsychosocial model, looks at different areas of uh, human function fields, physical, psychological, social, um, and then also there's frailty phenotypes, cognitive, social, psychological, you know, oral and nutritional. And there's, there's no consensus, but it's a, it's a fun area of research because there's a lot of like work to be do done. There's a lot of ways to contribute um, to that literature. And this is, was a nice recent summary in this past year in, um, in 2022 in Lancet. And, um, you know, all these different ways of assessing frailty is what we're trying to figure out what's the best to predict, you know, how, how outcomes are going to go and how our patients are going to do. So when we talk about frailty, this is a nice way to kind of think of this. When it comes to patients above the dotted line, being independent and below it being dependent, if you have a minor illness, a UTI or something, you know, most people don't become, don't go from independent to deep to dependent with that. But if you have a massive surgery or, you know, uh, health challenge, you can become dependent. And then your, your, where you're starting from is kind of what frailty is about. Like how, how robust, how much physiological reserve we say do you have so that when an insult comes, you know, are you temporarily dependent? Are you forever dependent? Do you die? You know, what, what kind of complications do you undergo? Um, so this is a good example of that. In the green line, you have someone who's fit. They have a minor illness. Well, they never really were in danger of being losing their independence. But if you have a minor illness and a real frail older patient, well, maybe they do become dependent and go to a nursing home and then, you know, different things can happen. So our job as is, is, uh, neurosurgeons and physicians in general is to never do any harm to patients. And so I think, you know, frailty, any, any area of outcome prediction with, in neurosurgery, we have a large responsibility to never do procedures that are going to lead to harm in patients. Um, and so that's kind of where all of this um, kind of develops from is trying to figure out who we can help and who are we going to end up hurting. It would have been better if we hadn't even, you know, tried to help them because um, nobody wants to be disabled for the most part or, you know, have, have bad outcomes. So this is all about doing no harm. And I think within, within a, this is an area we're studying a separate offset of frailty, but there's an invasiveness component to this. If you're super frail and you're having a small skin tag or, you know, a wart or skin lesion removed, probably less important than someone having an open thoracotomy in the emergency room. You know, it's not going to, frailty is going to matter more with the more of the, going back to this idea, the more of the impact that someone's having, how, how much insult are they, are they, are they undergoing? That's going to affect the, you know, the physiological reserve. Um, so we're always, we're just, we're just trying to predict, you know, what's going to happen. And I think that frailty provides us, as I'll kind of show today, um, with some tools that are helpful. Um, you know, it's not perfect yet. It's a very brand new kind of area within neurosurgery, but I think we're, we're starting to get some answers and it's helping us quite a bit in terms of who, how we can counsel, you know, family members and patients. There's a lot of areas that can go into the, into frailty and there's different models as we talked about earlier. You can look at nutrition, mobility, um, strength. I, you know, sarcopenia is, uh, you know, you've all met the, the older patient that's super frail, the ones with, you know, cancer and cachexia who have like very thin muscle everywhere. And they just look like they or at the lightest weight they've ever been, and and they're super kind of emaciated and malnourished. Um, you know how does sarcopenia affect outcome? Look at all the things that go into sarcopenia. How can we correlate that with you know robustness and and frailty? Use that in outcome prediction. Is is there is everyone familiar with this American TV show, The The Price Is Right? Is, it, is everyone heard of this or knows? Okay, I'm just gonna play one little clip. Kelsey. 2500 in cash, a trip to Oregon, and a trip to Japan in a showcase. She has to guess the price of all this. Actual retail price? If she goes over, she's out. $22,498. You were over by two. He's happy. She's not. She was only over by $2, but she loses. If we miss guess with frailty, if we tell a family, hey, like I did with that, they, with the 82-year-old that was super robust and had a small superficial glioblastoma, 
if I say, Hey, I think we can get you through the surgery safely. If I just missed by a little bit, it doesn't, it's like the showcase showdown. If you're over by a dollar, if you miss guess by just a little bit and they end up dying and like that patient goes home, comes back and ends up passing away, regardless of the circumstances, you, you've overbid and you've lost. Now there's ethical considerations for us as surgeons, taking people to the OR and wanting to know, being able to predict fairly accurately how they're going to do. There's also in the United States, there's a lot of quality, surgical quality implications. This is a, you know, a, a group for surgical um, neuro-oncologists um, in Pakistan. So, you know, we are, we deal with patients that are sick. We deal with patients that have complex surgical requirements and you know, outcomes aren't perfect um, for anyone. So, you know, in the United States, there's a lot of emphasis on quality, but, you know, there's the ethical obligations of the surgeon, but also institutions that judge. And you really want to know um, for all kinds of reasons who you're taking to surgery to try to predict the best you can, how they're going to do. And you don't want to be, you don't want to be over. And this is a cemetery in, in New York where I practiced my first three years. Um, it's been around for, you know, 400 years in that area. And there, this quote from uh, Rene LaRiche, which every surgeon carries about him a cemetery in which from time to time he goes to pray, a cemetery of bitterness and regret, of which he seeks the reason for certain of his failures. You know, we all hate having bad outcomes, but if we're always doing our best and making decisions based on the best evidence and being technically safe, we still can't, you know, ensure perfect outcomes. We can at least know that we're doing everything in our power to try and figure it out. And with frailty research, I feel like we're moving the field forward to try and make a difference and, I feel, and, it, and it's helping. And so that's kind of what drives me, um, you know, in doing the, doing this research. Um, this is my daughter. Um, she's been kind of started playing soccer this year and sometimes just enjoys dressing up and hanging out with her friends. But, and this is my son and I, when we were in London, we happened to be arrived the day that Messi and Argentina were playing against Italy. So that was a pretty amazing experience to go down there. We had tickets in the Argentina section and we're singing and, you know, had a good time. Never been to something like that. So it was pretty fun. Um, when I was a fellow, this is at Swedish Neuroscience Institute in Seattle. Uh, there was a talk by Dr. John Street from just up north, the next, um, right across the border in Canada, who, who kind of introduced this concept of frailty to me. And that was in like the spring, like March, April. I started as an attending in June at, in New York. And I just, as I was getting ready to set up this, this research network we were trying to build and like build an academic program, I was started looking at frailty and knew that I was going to focus my career on this because it kind of had aligned with everything I'd looked at during my training. And I came across this paper right as I was getting started that kind of gave me the inspiration also of like why frailty can be so cool. So they took 150 about patients that presented to the, emer to the emergency room with a metastatic melanoma to the brain. And they just took the group in half. They took, they measured the temporalis muscle thickness and they took the median of that. And they took the group that, you know, the half that was in the thicker group and the thinner group. And just on that alone, they could, you know, determine the, the, the muscle thickness, the survival was 13 months if you were in the thick group, and it was it was five months if you were in the thin group. And that was the only factor. Um, so it was an independent predictor of survival in melanoma patients with brain metastases. And so that I found early on was like, that's very cool. I, you know, I didn't know it was right at the beginning. Turns out I haven't even published a, a paper specifically looking at, at sarcopenia because it doesn't correlate all the time. But this is the idea, the concept of how can we find things that tell us how patients are going to do? Because that's pretty cool to have a blunt of tool just that simple, as opposed to having to look at all the genetics or everything else to know how patients are going to are going to do overall. Um, so um, this is just showing that the two groups, the thick, you know, more robust, presumably patients in the green, and the survival curves for those that are more the more frail, the thinner muscle. And so um, one of the things that we've done in the last couple of years is we collect you know frailty data prospectively on all our patients, and there's different scales. That we'll talk about a little bit, but one of the simple ones is just the visual kind of clinical frailty scale. This really just speaks to um, patients' mobility, so it's not the only thing we, that we use. And but you know, if your patient's number eight on you know end of life on hospice, obviously they're going to do worse than someone that's very fit. But um, mobility is just one part of it. The Canadian Health um, Survey and the Canadian Study on Health and Aging Frailty Index looks at all these variables. They had seventy different items. And this is very, very good for predicting outcomes if you use all 70 of these items. But as neurosurgeons, um, I'm sure even more in Pakistan than here, you have a million patients that you could be seeing all day long. You do not have time, not even the residents have time to sit there in the emergency room or in the clinic and go through a 70 item um, sheet because, you know, we're in a hurry. This is an American uh, cartoon that kind of speaks to that. Well, I was hoping you could run a play for us. We are in a really big hurry. 
Sure. What's the plate? Two nine T number. Two nine T H D zero three. This is a sloth named Flash. Two nine T H D zero three. T. So. I usually can't even sit through it all the way. I usually just skip it before we get there. But for, for frailty research to be practical, we cannot be going through 70 items with every patient. Um, and so this is where trying to make, take that concept and what we knew that with those 70 item scale from the Canadian Health Study is really helpful. We have to make it more practical. And so I love this paper, which kind of started this um, back in 2011, where um, in the United States, we have these quality database indexes. So using the National Surgical Quality Improvement Programs, the NSQIP database, they just took, looked at these 70 items and they took the ones that were automatically collected and they called it the modified frailty index 11. It's basically 11 variables that are collected by, by the, this huge government database. And, and, to, and so all these papers start coming out on not in neurosurgery yet, but just in frailty and trauma, all these other fields. But then in 2015, so the bureaucrats, without even knowing about this, they just change the variables and they get rid of six of them and it comes down to five. So then all the literature from that year on is all the MFI-5, even to this day, modified frailty index five, just be, had nothing to do with frailty. They just changed the data in the database what they were collecting. And so when I when I left my fellowship in Swedish, got to New York, and we were, my boss was uh, had hired me, was the vice chair during all my residency. I'd known him for a lot of years. And he wanted me to um, change the academic nature of this program and get a bunch of research going because they hadn't been doing a lot of research. And that was one of the reasons he was hired. And so I knew very early when I, I got there and I looked at the literature that there was very little in neurosurgery on this topic, but I knew it was a massively important topic because I'd seen it my whole residency. And, and I just knew that this was an area that, that I could very clearly, once I heard that talk for the first time, I said, I knew that day when I had that lecture that I was going to spend the rest of my career, presumably working in this field and that there was a massive need. So the first thing I did, I just, just with some medical students, we just looked at the literature. And at the time when we started doing this, there was only um, 25 papers in neurosurgery and 20 of them were spine and five were cranial. Um, we published this not until 2020, but we really did this right when I got to New York in June of 2017, we started. Um, and this is what all the literature was. We can see the cranial at the top. There was a GBM kind of paper that it referenced. There was a spontaneous cerebral hemorrhage, chronic subdural. Uh, a larger NSQIP tumor paper and, a, and a, another mixed kind of pathology. And this is a lot more spine. I'm um, obviously this how it broke down, but I could also tell that the literature was very, very variable. Um, these are at the top are all these different ways people were classifying frailty. So they were taking, uh, if you have zero of the MFI 11, for example, you have a zero and you can go all the way up to one, you know, depending on how many of the factors you have, but people were defining it, you know, very differently. So that's why we called this paper just the heterogeneity. It was all over the place, um, you know, showed how it was done and classified. But um, we started, you know, started looking at all this and I'd had a database of acoustic patients that uh, I had set up during residency. So one of the ENT, um, you know, fellows or residents had contacted me about, he wanted to, knew what we were doing frailty and wanted to look at that. So we started looking at, at, at this for length of stay. It wasn't very surprising that the patients that were more frail stayed longer in the hospital. Um, we started looking at transfers. Um, this is it was just a, we have a lot of patients that transfer in um, to academic centers, and we're trying to figure out you know who's getting transferred. And we suspected it had a lot to do with insurance, but it ended up you know as a part of it and frailty and complexity. But it was really um, you know had to do with uh, the complexity of the surgeries and how frail um, you know patients were, and. Um, you know, then we looked at, you know, acoustics with like age that we talked about earlier. That was the original paper I'd done, kind of had led me down this path. But we started looking at all the different pathologies. And this is all, there was nothing in really any of these areas. So we started looking at angionative subarachnoid hemorrhages. And what was really interesting about this is the more frail the patients were, the worse their Hunt Hess scores were and Fisher scores were for, um, sorry, for, for, uh, this is angionegative, not aneurysms, but angionegative subarachnoid hemorrhage. But it also predicted their discharge, you know, status. And what really kind of surprised us is are the, these are two ROC curves looking at mortality and discharge home. 
But, you know, as you looked at all this, your MFI number did better than anything else at predicting, you know, predicting outcomes. So that was really, really amazing for us to find. And kind of blew our mind that this just this frailty status was more important than anything else. <clears throat> Excuse me, in terms of the outcomes and how people did. So the frail angio-negative subarachnoid hemorrhage patients had worse outcomes, increased mortality compared to you know non-frail um, patients. So <clears throat> that was surprising. We started looking at subarachnoid hemorrhages. Um, how did age and frailty interact with that? Um, you know, the frail patients had worse subarachnoid hemorrhage or worse aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhages, more complications, increased mortality. But Hunt-Hest and age for aneurysmal patients were still more important at that moment as we were kind of looking at it. And today's talk is focused on, on neuro-oncology, so I'll skip you know a lot of this, but the point was just that we started looking at everything. Um, ICHs, more um, angio-negative subarachnoids, uh, angio-negative subarachnoids, um, looking at other factors, length of stay, acute subdural hematomas, um, chronic subdural hematomas, uh, odontoid fractures, spinal epidural abscesses, um, then in October of 20, uh, neurosurgical focus had their first uh, issue on older patients over 65 in cranial neurosurgery. So, um, you know, we wrote a topic, a paper on that. And then one of the first papers I was super proud of in our group, we looked at a retrospective series at our own institution, looking at frailty within meningioma patients. And this is, you know, going to seem obvious at, at this moment, but you know, if we showed that frailty was an independent risk factor for worse outcomes after meningioma surgery, including length of stay, readmission, worse discharge disposition. Um, and it seems obvious to us now, but like this had never really been shown before ever. Um, it made sense, but it it was it's super helpful as you're, a lot of our my meningioma patients are over 65 or, and they're older. And so we use this, you know, every, every time I'm in clinic, every consult I see these patients, we talk to them about this. And you know, for us, it's nice to say we're kind of, we're the group that does a lot of this research. And so we're pretty comfortable telling, telling them who has increased risk and who doesn't um, with that. And so, that, so that's really helpful. Um, this was just looking at that, that group of patients and looking how, you know, frailty versus non-frailty affected, um, you know, length of stay and the other factors such as, you know, where they did not discharge location and readmission rates. Um, so we, we then that was a retrospective small series. So we wanted to do a larger, you know, look at that um, using started using the database research. And Alice uh, Disipicatus was a med, is a medical student uh, applying this year to neurology. Who I started, you know, working with closely, and he's a genius wizard at, at all the coding. And so we looked at this for twenty thousand patients this time and found the same thing that frailty appeared to be more accurate than advanced patient age at predicting outcomes and predicting clavian dindo grade four uh, complications, which is like a return to the ICU, reoperation. Um, and then also for extended length of stay, when you take the top quarter, top 25% of all your patients length of stay, the people that stay the longest, it predicted, it predicted that, which is really nice for healthcare economics and predicting who's gonna do well, who's not gonna do well. Um, we looked at, um, so this was, that was from an NGOM and NSQIP. We then looked at, um, you know, with uh, another student looked at, how it affected, you know, a uh, different group of meningioma patients for a different period. And um, th this time with this National Surgical Quality Improvement Program instead of the nationwide inpatient sample, different database, but same showing the same results again, that this time when you use the National Surgical Quality Improvement Program database, it's a much cleaner database, but you get smaller numbers. Instead of 20,000, you're looking at 5,000. And sometimes, you know, it can be even smaller. So sometimes it can be a little tricky to show it, to show it, but your data is much more confident. You can't mess it up very easily with coding. It's a, it's a lot easier to work with students with it because it's it's a lot less, you know, um, it's a lot more safety proof. So we were really studying this in all these areas. And as you look at the multivariate in table three for mortality, you're uh, looking at the MFI5, your severe frail patients, you know, their odds ratios are massive, 11.17. You look at more major complications, age at the top doesn't even end up mattering all that much. Um, and we look at with the frailty, it's much more predictive for everything. Um, unplanned readmissions, major complications. These are large, large series. And whenever you have something in the National Surgical Quality Improvement Program, the NSQIP, NSQIP database, you know that the coding's clean, it gets audited, it's insured for accuracy. And you know it was just reaffirming for us what we kind of knew from our practice and what we saw every day. Um, this is showing the effect sizes um, for the different outcome variables and it's a nice visual way to see the same thing we were showing, which is, you know, the severely frail do terrible, comparatively speaking. So um, 
Whereas before people would offer, you know, advice about who to have surgery on and who not to based on age, someone's in their eighties or nineties, maybe they don't, you know, we were really during this period kind of using this data and this evidence, talk to patients and say, you know, for this, at this point, there's been in geoma, but to say, if you're severely frail, you know, um, and you trying to go undergo meningioma surgery, you're really going to have you at a higher risk for all these kind of complications. Um, and so, uh, we did the same thing looking at pituitaries um, and found that increasing frailty and not increasing age was a predictor for all of these complications. And once again, seems obvious now, but this had never been shown before. And pituitary surgery is not necessarily, you know, super um, uh, invasive or, you know, doesn't cause huge operative stresses compared to some other surgeries, but it was nice to see kind of the same thing. This is um, showing you the different cohorts and groupings. And as you look at the bottom, what I like about this, these figures, and this is true for a lot of the, the pathologies we pick, is if you look at the lower left where it, it, major complication A, as you go from left to right, you know, the incidence is pretty, it's pretty even, but on the red, you may have these big jumps. And so this is not uncommon to see graphs like this for each pathology type, that it's really, it's just less than you'd think. To, you don't have these massive jumps all the time for the age groups, but you do tend to have these usually huge increases with frailty, which is interesting. Um, and then looking at the, this is, a you know, this NSQIP project we did, looking at the, the variables with frailty and as you go across from age, it doesn't really make much of a difference, but your frailty status certainly does um, for your odds ratios of major complication, unplanned readmission. These severely frail always do terrible, almost for everything. And, and over and over and over for every project we were doing, it wasn't age that was making a difference in condition age, it was frailty. So this concept we were seeing over and over and over really became, you know, more and more important. And um, every paper we were doing showed this similar ROC, ROC curve. Um, you know, pink is random and then, you know, no, no predictability. But age, surprisingly, isn't that much different um, when you factor in for frailty. So you want your curve to be all the way up, you know, like it was for those, that, that angio-negative thoracic patients. You want it to be up, or, up to the left as far as possible. But it was significantly different for almost everything we looked at. And so we don't have a crystal ball yet, but we're getting an idea as we counsel patients that if you're severely frail, that's you are at a high risk for bad outcomes, complications, almost for everything we were looking at. I think this was a big moment for us as we were kind of like dialing in our, our research a little bit and understanding how to present the data better and like the analysis and the discussion. What's nice about doing the same research over and over um, the same methods and the same kind of process is you really can get good at it and perfect it. And so this is uh, a paper that was published in JAMA last year where we, JAMA, JAMA otolaryngology, head neck surgery, where we looked at the associations of frailty and age, the same kind of thing, but for vestibular schwannoma resections. So we're looking in, the, in this paper at 27,000 patients um, had, that underwent vestibular schwannoma resection. And, you know, what we found is, was the same kind of pattern here that it was frailty and not increasing age. It was what predicted, you know, um, what the worst outcomes. And then in the United States, we have a huge problem in, in uh, race, race and socioeconomic health disparities. And so that was a that was a factor in this too, for in-hospital mortality, you know, whether people had routine discharge and, and these extended length of stays. So um, this is for post-operative cerebral vascular infarction or hemorrhage. Um, and, you know, the MFI, I mean, that, that's a massively phenomenal difference in predictability and discrimination between MFI and age. And age is very, is not that great. MFI is fantastic, really, really strong predictability. And then this is a combination on the left of, of modified frailty index and um, non-white patients, kind of mixed together versus on the right, is all for mortality, um, just MFI alone um, on the versus age on the right. So uh, this, is, this was pretty exciting to start finding this out. Then we started looking at um, we looked at metastatic brain tumor resections, um, looking at frailty and, and age and the relationships with uh, post op mortality and duration of hospital stay. And, um, you know, large series uh, of patients, once again, 2015, 2018, this time using the nationwide inpatient sample and the MFI 11. And that's, you know, now we have 13,650 metastatic brain tumor patients. And once again, looking at the multivariate, it's frailty, this time using the MFI 11 because we're in the NIS. And so when we're in NIS, we can actually code the variables ourselves, whereas NSQIP had gone to that MFI-5 because it's the, bu the bureaucrats just, they decide what gets collected and what doesn't. We could still code for the original MFI-11. 
in the NIS ourselves. It's a lot more work, but we can kind of pick our variables that way based on the codes. And so um, we just showed that, you know, with post-operative mortality, once again, it was frailty, which is much more predictive. Um, and same thing with extended length of stay. And um, we did the same thing looking at spinal tumors, um, as opposed to neurospine, 5,000 patients and very clean database with an SQIP and showing the same thing. It was increasing frailty using the MFI-5 again, which was a more robust predictor compared to age for poor post-operative outcomes. Um, and this is just showing you the tables for the multivariate. Um, once again, you can see across the board, common theme, we don't wanna be in the severely frail group on the bottom row. Um, if you go all the way across, everything's significant and significantly increased two, three, five, 16 times uh, for death in particular. And this is the ROC curve, um, you know, looking at age and MFI5, age is in blue, a little better than, than um, you, what we've been seeing for age. But once again, the, you know, the green, the frailty score, high, much more predictable in that, in that case. So crystal ball is not perfect, but like I said, we're getting it dialed in. I'm not going to focus on the non-oncology stuff today, but we, you know, wrote a letter on, on spinal cord injury saying how we thought frailty would really, you know, was important in that, in this demographic. And just this, um, just this month, um, in this month's red journal in October, um, this paper, uh, is published on looking at 8,800 operative traumatic spinal cord injury patients and showing that frailty was an uh, independent predictor of clinical outcomes after traumatic, um, spinal cord injury. And especially in particular amongst patients of advanced age. And um, there was a commentary published um, with that with that paper and looking at transfers uh, more applicable to this group, looking at how we predict outcomes for patients that were transferred in using the National Surgical Quality Improvement Program, the NSUIP data, 50,000 patients um, with this group as well, showing that um, you know these patients that were transferred for cranial surgery were more likely to have worse outcomes and that frailty was an independent predictor of those outcomes. Um, and so this, you know, provided the basis to use frailty in your assessments of, of transfers and of what, um, of what your outcomes were, but um, unplanned readmission, non-routine discharge, major complication, mortality, reoperation, all, you know, all significantly uh, associated with, with increasing frailty. Um, and all up to this point, almost all these papers were MFI fives. And um, in NSQIP, but then NSQ and MFI 11 and NIS, if we set it up that way, this is just kind of a, a book chapter we wrote um, showing how, if you're going to have a special pathway for geriatric patients, how you may need to get more people involved pre and post operatively, special consultant services, geriatricians, dietitians, different ideas of ways you can do that. Other chapters and books talking about neurosurgery and just elderly patients and how uh, with frailty and how we can adapt. Um, you know, how does this factor into decisions about palliative care versus, op, you know, versus intervening and operating on patients? Um, this is one of the coolest things about an area of research you develop like a passion for and you're really interested in is I'm, you know, we're, we've gotten all these papers published and so we're going to use this to apply for an R01 NIH grant. And so you want to look at length of stay because if you don't find anything with frailty, if you're looking at a topic and you don't have enough patients, let's say your power is not high enough, you almost always can find length of stay for frailty to be worse versus healthy patients. And so this was really interesting, but I, at our institution, it's a public hospital and it's difficult to have beds for patients that need to go to rehab. So what we found was we had a unique circumstance in our hospital where the surgeons didn't really have, don't really have block time, it's busy for everyone. And before we got here, cause I'm looking at historical data at UNM, the surgeons, all the surgeons did meningiomas, it was less subspecialized. So it was kind of an internal control, like all the surgeons operated on different days, so I could, it was very easy to do this study, but the concept was for, and this is might this may not be as applicable to Pakistan, I'll have to talk about it afterwards, but like we could have patients come in and it, you don't get block time or an OR spot right away. You have to wait for like an OR time and then you operate and then they recover. And if they're ready to go home, let's say they need to go to rehab, you they might wait another several days, a week. But as a surgeon in our healthcare system, we get the blue box here in the bottom, the middle, the measured length of stay, but I like to use the analogy for, and we used it in this paper and this letter, but it's like a plane. If you're taking, if you're, if you board the plane and you're ready to go, but you can't get out, it doesn't make sense to, to like punish the, the pilot, like count that against the pilot's flight time. But that's kind of how it is in the United States for surgery. I don't know if it's the same way in Pakistan, but why are we, if we can't, if we're just, we're ready to go for surgery, but we can't go because we're stuck on the tarmac. Why does that count against the surgeon? And then same thing, if you're getting ready to land, 
and the, and the airport's busy, say you're going to JFK in New York, you could circle for a while, but that shouldn't really be counting against the pilot too. So this has kind of led to a whole other area of research we're doing, um, looking at frailty, but in this, it's this ready for discharge concept. If patients were, were going home, it didn't matter because you can go home very easily on a Saturday or Sunday. But we took all the patients that had surgery on Monday and Tuesday, called it early week, and then looked at all the patients that were having surgery Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And if they're having surgery Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we have less therapists able to move them on the weekend and they end up kind of sitting around. And so for patients that what it was patients really not going home, but to, uh, to rehab or whatever, they basically lost those two days and it didn't matter controlling for everything, surgeon, uh, you know, everything else. It was the early versus the late week. And that's just a reflection of the U S healthcare system and how we allocate resources and how we're always short on the weekends. Um, but you know, I, this is something we had to look into because if we're going to do a big RO one NIH study, and we're going to look at length of stay as a big part of that metric. We've got to make sure we can accurately predict that, um, you know, so forth. And it was fine for going home, but it wasn't fine if they were if they were trying to, you know, stay. They had to go to a different place. So, as you can see in that lower right multivariate, that late that late um, week group, you know, when they weren't going home, way way increased risk, you know, risk six and a half times. So, um, I'm going to shift just a little bit. Besides uh, having an interest in like frailty part, the, you know, as I said earlier, we were hired to rebuild the neurosurgery research infrastructure at this program. And it wasn't a program that was publishing a lot. And so they hired us to, to improve that. And that was one of the charges, you know, my boss had given me. And uh, there was such a need within frailty to like basically start defining this for all these different areas. So it was very simple to, to come up with a research program and a plan for how we were going to tackle, you know, this. And so we developed this like intensive research initiative. We, this is like, after we did this for the two years, we published it in the, in the journal of uh, graduate medical education and basically just showing that when we, and this is all built on research on frailty research, essentially, but by using this, this, this program, we, this was the, the number of publications they'd had in the department before we got there in 2018 or 2017. So we started this, um, you know, where I got there in the summer, but we started it really January 1st. And from 2018, 2020, we, we, we uh, had, you know, weekly research meetings. We, um, ha you know, any, the residents could basically say at these meetings, they had to pick a goal for what it was between the, like, we did more or less focused monthly, but between this month and next month, what are you going to do for research? And it didn't matter what you said. And if you had the boards, you could say nothing. But if you said something, you needed to needed to do everything to fulfill that. So kind of under promise, but then make sure once you promise to do something, you're going to get it done. And this is just looking at residents in blue, medical students in, in red. And really, the medical students have always kind of been a group I've always worked with and enjoy working with and kind of the heart of our research. And we you know we were able to make a dramatic difference. And this was all built on this frailty research. And so um, when I got to... New University of New Mexico, they had just lost the residency. That's why we were hired. So it was just, you know, Dr. Schmidt and I got there and we were a bare bones team, but we started building this, like we, we had to get the service stabilized the first several months. But then by, you know, about January, um, uh, Dr. Syed Kazim, this, this, uh, who's from, who went to Aga Khan and was one of our pre-residents, him and I really started working together and developing this, um, this, the same thing we did in New York. I knew the minute we got to New Mexico, we we're going to do the exact same thing. It's one of the the, the things I'd interviewed on for the job and told them that Dr. Schmidt and I could do, I knew we could do it here because we'd just done it successfully in New York. And so I had Dr. Kazim who has a, he went to Aga Khan and then he came to the United States and did a PhD in uh, translational neuroscience at, at uh, Sinai for five years and did a post back for three years. And he was, you know, interested in it and helping. And so, you know, this is what we're, we haven't published this yet, but we've just analyzed it a couple weeks ago. We're really we started the program January of eight of 20. So we're kind of a couple months behind still. We got to wait till this year finishes out, but this is just a kind of a prelim look. And at the upper left graph, you can see we've started, you know, made a big difference in terms of publications. And then what I'm more proud of, I think, is in the lower left, the blue are papers without medical students or residents or pre-residents, which we have here at UNM on it. And so before we got here, you know, most papers, 70% of the papers didn't have any medical students, residents, or pre-residents on them. Um, and so since we got here in the red is what we've kind of been able to flip that around, make it the opposite. And then on the right, um, where the green, you know, almost 90% of our papers have residents, med students, pre-residents, whereas, you know, the before that, um, you know, even now, the other part of it was uh, before we got here was, you know, about 22% or so um, had the medical students. And so, you know, 
I, we have anyone who gets to do brain tumor, everyone in this group who operates on the brain and spine tumors has the greatest job in the world, in my opinion. And so I, you know, what, what makes me really happy is helping my patients out, but then helping medical students and residents um, get research because that's how they get into these very competitive specialties in the United States. And so that's kind of an area, just as much as I love frailty research, I love mentoring medical students, helping them be super successful. I didn't have that. I got into residency without any research. I had never done research before. And I was fortunate enough to end up at a really world-class program at the University of Utah with Dr. Bill Coldwell and got, they had a system in place. It was like an assembly line. You just got in there and they had all the resources, the help, editors, and you could be really productive if you hadn't done it before. But frailty research has really allowed um, you know, me to help a ton of medical students out. And that's, that's been a big, you know, a big, uh, blessing for us. This is Dr. Kazim, um, presenting, um, our research. And this is kind of a lot of the members of our team, our pre-residents, our residency coordinator, Lisa, Dr. Kazim in purple. And this is, a uh, re our resident office space. We, you know, we developed for the, for the team as part of our residency reapplication. Um, we, we got our residency back in April. So it was about about 20 months. There weren't residents in the program while we were building this. Um, but this is, you know, uh, Dr. Kazim, we, this is how we kind of like organized the projects. I had all these, I think we've worked with 120 students in the last two years during this. Um, and a lot of the students don't work out. You know, you give them low projects of low priority and in initially, and you just kind of see who, you can very quickly kind of see who's really wants to be successful with that. And then you start, you know, spending more time with them and working on it. Um, but that, you know, th this was just after one year, all the, you know, um, that first year of 2021. And then we had 32 abstracts and these are all these medical students and, and groups that are on that. And so the other publication was that, that one from New York, but we're going to submit this in January after we tabulate everything and then, you know, for the same thing. So this is, uh, Everybody in the United States, once we got the residency back, I had like 75 applications in my inbox, like within, you know, a week. So everybody wants this residency position once you get it back. But I was, this was in the spring, I was with uh, Dr. Kazim it, um, and he pulled his phone out and I, he was pulling up his calendar and I just happened to like look and I'm like, what is that? And he showed me and, you know, he'd had this thing, I just took a screenshot of it, but he had from like nine in the morning on his day off on Saturday till like midnight with like meetings with students, like every 30, you know, 60 minutes. And everybody wants the residency position, but very few people want to do that kind of work in their free time and be, you know, be dedicated to developing something. And so I just show that to people because, you know, anybody can be successful in, in this. You just have to, you know, work at it and have a passion for it and you can be successful. And this is one of our pre-residents, our pre-residents now on the right, all the projects we are in right now, just for his list. And he's a really a wizard at stats and he's facilitating. And so if you have a passion for research and like, and, and outcomes and you love this, you will, and you, and you really want, and both of them are very motivated for the residency, but you know, you can do it, but everybody comes to you once you have it, but not everybody wants to do this kind of what this it takes to get, to get to that spot. So this is our frailty lab that we've done the last two years. We have 120 students who worked with 40 publications, but another hundred that um, are in route and process. And um, we're actually, it's kind of an exciting time because we just spent the last six months developing a new scale using the NIS and we're excited to get that out. So, and then, as I said, on April 1st, we got our residency, you know, back, um, this is Dr. Schmidt, um, who's kind of been the, uh, the support and senior advisor for all of this that we set up and the chair of our department. And so that's been the kind of exciting thing for us. And Dr. Kazim is our first resident and is, you know, doing, doing uh, phenomenally well. And so when I started this research, as I said, in the beginning, we knew we were going to do a lot of MFI, MFI five and 11 papers, but that's just a baseline, like defining frailty and what that means in these populations. I had kind of envisioned how I wanted to like make this so this was sustainable and kind of progress in the future and refine it a little bit. And so we'll talk really briefly before we finish up here about the risk analysis index, which is a better scale that I kind of knew was coming. Then um, once I got to New Mexico, I learned about it, but there's a retrospective versions of it. There's prospective versions of it. And I knew that I wanted to start with what we were doing, but I knew eventually we wanted to get to the red, which is like, can we affect how outcomes? That's great to like know that frailty predicts all these bad outcomes, but can we do anything to modify it? Can we do a prehabilitation program? If it's a glioblastoma patient, they probably can't go do a two month like rehab. But what if it's a spinal stenosis patient and they're in their eighties and they're frail? Can we have them do a physical therapy rehabilitation or you know, AKA prehabilitation? and then show that there's been, we can make a difference in outcomes. Um, you know, and so that's kind of where I see this research like like heading, but there's just so much that hadn't been done that 
you know, we're still finishing a bunch of MFI 11 papers. And then we're really focusing these next couple of years, um, you know, on these RAI, these risk analysis index. Um, this is just, this is something we're submitting um, next month. It's a overall review of every single frailty paper ever published. And this is a little bit older data from like four or five months ago, but it shows you that the majority of this frailty research in neurosurgery is in spine, um, you know, uh, uh, and then they're all very similar. Most of them are retrospective cohort studies or retrospective analyses of prospective data, very few other, other types of studies in there. And this is the interesting slide because these are all the frailty scales that people are using. Now, at least half, the nice part is at least half are in MFI 5 or MFI 11, largely because we can do that very quickly with the computers and with the stats. Once you have a good team that knows what they're doing, it's not that hard. So I had Dr. all those meetings Dr. Kazim had on his phone was, teaching people how to run these analyses. And if you do NSQIP, they can't mess it up very easily. If you do NIS, it's it's it's, it's very easily, it's a lot easier to mess up than it is to not do. But there's all these different scales that people have developed and used. And it's a real, in some ways it's good, but other ways it's a little bit of a problem if they're not really frailty scales and they're called that. And so, you know, this makes it, this area of research is not going anywhere. It's gonna be around for a very long time and it is exponentially growing. Um, and so these are the ones that everyone kind of knows, but there's all these other scales people are trying to use. And um, this is just the early data on, on, on this and what the different, these are by, if you look at the very far left, the publication year, you know, it's 2016 all the way up to where we are now. And it's, it's really exponentially growing. And spine is, you know, a big portion of it, but brain and spine tumor, neuro-oncology for this group is a large chunk as well, um, almost, you know, 40% or so. And um, MFI 11, MFI 5, we've talked about, but other frailty scores will make up a less of a, of a, of a portion of Charleston comorbidity index, the adult spinal deformity index, kind of disease specific. And then we've written about 20% of the papers. I think it will be about 25 in the next few months by the time we get the rest of these papers out. Um, so what, the last little few minutes I have here, um, this is Dr. Rohini McKee, a good colleague and collaborator with us. She's in charge. She's the surgical quality officer for the entire health system at UNM. And when I signed my contract in January of 20, she met with me online and she had, we had a shared interest in frailty and she actually gets the credit for introducing me to the risk analysis index, which is a much better index for frailty measurement than the modified frailty index we were using. Um, in some ways, the modified index five, for example, isn't even much of a frailty scale. It just chooses five variables, diabetes. Um, you know, it, it lists just these, these different, it has one that's whether you're completely functionally in, um, dependent, you get a point. Then you get a point for diabetes, heart failure, COPD, but it's very, it's basically four comorbidities and then just whether you're dependent or not on somebody. But um, this is this is work by Dr. Dan Hall, who Dr. McKee, Rahini introduced me to and has been a huge help to us because uh, he's been doing this for many years and published frequently in JAMA um, for their projects. And, and they did a bunch of work in the VA system and this risk analysis index, which I'll go through briefly, but it's really good for predicting. They like to use it prospectively and measure mortality at six months, 12 months. And it really does a phenomenal job of predicting, predicting, predicting death. And um, the clinical RAI scale, the risk analysis index, there's administrative at the top, and that's what you can use for the NSQIP, which is nice. Um, but, you know, ever since we got here, Dr. Kazim and I set up, starting in January of 20, this um, RAIC prospective uh, data work. And so every patient in neurosurgery we see gets this 14 item survey. It takes about 30 to 40 seconds. Every consult and every in the clinic, every consult in the emergency room, every HP, we do this. And you can do it very quickly because you, you're just used to doing it. But it, on the bottom, the more points you have, the worse. So, you know, the red is the really severely frail, and then the green is the robust. And this is looking at, you know, 18, you know, all the way to the right, 24 months of an NSQIP surgery. You have, you know, 30% of your patients in the red group have died versus almost nobody in the green. So it it is for almost everything we look at it is in particular mortality. That's how it was calibrated and developed. That is what it's really good at predicting mortality. Um, and uh, they use this in this in these uh, in this intro this, you introduced this in this hospital. They just said surge to surgeons. You have to score them and just when you post the case and book a surgery, you have to put the score down. And just doing that alone caused a massive reduction in mortality. For them at that hospital by just getting people to like have to think it no no one judged you no one said anything but if you if you uh you had to put a score on paper which meant somebody had to score it and look at it and that caused this big huge difference so 
Dr. McKee had, you know, introduced this to me and met Dr. Hall. And that was when I really cemented that next direction. I knew we were going to be doing all these other frailty type research, but that was when I really figured out, okay, we're going to do RAIA right now, 2020, 2021, because we have the databases and the knowledge to do that with Dr. Kazim's help. He was teaching all these students and spending all his time doing that um, when he wasn't in the hospital. And then I knew that this year in particular was going to be the RAIC year because we started collecting it. And you want to, when you're doing the frailty perspective data, you want a good year, at least, if not two, to follow it. Because that's the whole point of that is predict the outcome over time. So um, as we started looking at these, you know, in the blue is the RAIA for pituitary. We submitted that as a letter to, to uh, the Red Journal and they said, send it back as a full article. So we're expanding that out, but showing that it does, instead of looking at now, sorry, age, they, all the graphs you've seen up to this point were MFI five versus age. Now we're looking at RAI versus MFI. So as bad as, as MFI five made age look as a predictor, risk analysis index is doing that to the MFI five for mortality. Um, and not for all outcomes, but for it's, it's really developed and mathematically modeled to predict death. And so, um, it, it's far superior predicting death um, in these. And as we go you know, across all these outcomes, this is a paper we just got accepted finally um, for in, um, I believe it's Journal of Neuro-Oncology. It's hard for me to keep track of them unless I'm looking at the list, but this is showing you the same thing. If you pick any of these and you look at like the MFI five scores in the blue circles, and it's looking at whatever our odds ratio is for any of these outcomes, if you look all the way up the RAI score at the top, these in these more severe frailty groups, they're much more predictive of outcomes. The odds ratios are much higher for whatever we're looking at. You can the on the left is so the first row is mortality, and you can see with the blue, there's not as much of a difference, but you get to those severe frailty groups in the red, and it's highly predictive. Um, and so that kind of holds true all the way across. Uh, we're down to my last couple minute or two here, so I'm going to skip these because it's kind of a similar theme. But we're doing the, these same papers for pituitaries now and you know, showing all this stuff. Um, this is not for this group, but when we look at these for spine, it's extremely, you know, once again, the blue is RAI, the orange is MFI. So it's that much better. It's far superior. This is ACDFs with death that had never been shown before, even to this day on frailty. So we've submitted that for publication to JAMA surgery. And, um, you know, it's been fun because it's really a powerful and effective. I think I'll just end with showing you guys this form for the RAIC, it, look, you get points if your ADLs are impaired. So if people have ADL impairment, you really start gaining a lot of points on it. If you have you know, cancer, if you have shortness of breath, it scores all these and it's pretty simple. We use a dot phrase in our electronic medical record system. Uh, Dr. Kazim helped us just develop that. So everyone puts, the, puts dot, 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 RAI, and this all pops up. And now the whole hospital is using it. The surgeons in particular, but we're expanding it out to the ER and other places. So when you get a consult, you know, someone will just send you, be like brain tumor, 70 year old patient, you like don't know, you know, now we're starting to get services providing us with like the frailty scores and gives us an idea of what we're dealing with. Um, and so the, when you score this REI, if you have cancer on the right, you get way more points than someone that doesn't have cancer, which makes sense because we're following this out for a year, but that that's what makes a massive difference with this. So for this group, you know, in particular, that makes a huge difference because for neuro-oncology, you're going to be dealing with much sicker patients. And so the risk analysis index does a really great job of, of predicting that. Um, and I always tell people this, like frailty is not the most important thing in the world, right? I'd always rather be, I'd rather be a severe, severely frail GCS 15 after my trauma, my concussion, than a GCS three, super healthy, robust, that's, you know, fixed daily people. So it, it's, it's important, but it's not everything, obviously, you know, comatose it, consciousness, you know, matters more. Um, and then we've been, we just wrote a series of seven letters to the editors of these major journals that were publishing a scale that was like. It kind of an odd scale in the sense that it took post-operative complications and outcomes based on the coding and used them as frailty, give frailty scores. And so we're pretty, you know, adamant that like when we're using frailty screen, we really want it to be something you can use preoperatively for patients and you want it to help you predict how people are going to do. And I think that's the whole benefit and utility of it. Um, and you have to be careful with the coding because it's easy to mess up, especially if you're using NIS. And so we've, we've been hopefully able to kind of correct that, but um, I'm going to end there and thanks for you guys listening to me cover a lot of material and a lot of, um, in a short period of time. Um, this is the Sandia mountains. I, I kind of live at the foothills of those. And then we kind of took this picture on the other side of town out in the West side to get that. And this is a, this was us last year and all in the fall a year ago. So thanks for everyone's time. I'm happy to answer questions and chat about whatever you guys want.